Hi, my name is Dan Callahan. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to weave kind of midway through the meetup. Um, not midway through my talk, though sometimes I <laughs> should do or want to do, but uh, there will be live coding. Um, because the buses to Belfast, where I've, I've recently moved, or the buses run late, but the train only runs till about half eight. So uh, if you have questions, catch me early after the talk. I work at Mozilla. You can find me on Twitter as Callahad. I think that's all in the meetup notes. Um, and I want to start by talking about the web. This is a Node meetup, but Node comes from web technology. So I think it makes sense to talk about the web and browsers. And, and I promise this will come back to the server side. In the beginning, the web was just HTML, right? Like, what is web technology? It's hypertext markup language. It's markup. Well, what if we want interactivity and, and presentation? And, OK, that wasn't enough. There was something missing. Two somethings missing. So we added CSS and JavaScript to the web. And that has been the standard stack when you say web technology that people think of for the past 20 years. There's still something missing. When you think about programming languages, or at least when I think about programming languages, I, I tend to put them somewhere kind of fuzzy in my mind on this spectrum from high level languages and low level languages. And at the low level, there's obviously you know, the lowest level raw machine code, the actual instructions, the physical CPU inside your computer understands. And just slightly higher level than that are languages like C, C++, Rust is actually over here as well, that aren't quite machine code, but give you more or less complete control over what sort of machine code gets generated. And I think control is the, for me at least, and control over memory in particular, is the distinguishing characteristic, in my mind, between a low level language like Rust, C, C++, and high-level languages like JavaScript, Python, Ruby, Elm, TypeScript, um, and then languages that are somewhere in the middle like Java, C Sharp, Go, and Swift. So on, on one end, the high-level end, you don't really have any control over you know, what does this data look like in memory. In the middle, you can have some control, but even in, in Swift and even in Go, you're not manually allocating and freeing the memory the way you might in the low-level language. And so when we're, when we're building software, if you're building for a native platform like Linux, Mac OS, Windows, Android, iOS, there's the ability to choose from any language on the spectrum and pick the right tool for what you're trying to accomplish. And it's actually common to pick multiple tools. So if you take the Python community, Python has a massive sub-community in scientific and statistical computing. And so many of those libraries tend to be implemented in C or Fortran, but wrapped up in Python modules. So you can keep your kind of application logic in a high level language where you don't have to think about the nitty gritty implementation details and you get the convenience of the programming you know, experience, the expressivity that you get with high level language. But when you need to, you can go and implement something in a low level language. We also enjoy the same, same choice with Node on the server side because we're targeting a native platform. But when you go to the web, your only choice is JavaScript. And JavaScript is a great language, but JavaScript is a high-level language, which means it has really strong opinions about what data types are and how memory is going to be managed. You can't opt out of garbage collection in JavaScript. You can't say, you know, allocate this much memory, and I promise I'll never use more than that. Just, you can't do it, because it's a high-level language. It has strong opinions. So if you had a problem that would be more amenable to a different programming paradigm, and you're targeting the browser, you're kind of out of luck. That's the missing piece that WebAssembly is trying to fill. What WebAssembly is, is it's kind of a, a virtual abstract machine code. It's not code for an actual physical CPU, but it's really close to it. It's kind of the least common denominator between Intel and ARM and MIPS processors. Just this very low level raw instruction set that knows about numbers and knows about memory, and that's about it. But you can do math there, and that's kind of the same thing as C or C++. Everything else can be built on top of that abstraction. And so now, if you take something and you write a compile to WebAssembly, you can hand that WebAssembly to a runtime, V8 for Node or your browser or any other particular engine, and that can then translate it very quickly and efficiently to native machine code. That's what WebAssembly is doing. So the web tech stack. No longer just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It's HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and WebAssembly. We've got markup, presentation, high level, low level. And I think that more or less completes the toolkit for using web technology to build kind of any sort of application you might want. Can you use WebAssembly? This is a screenshot from canIuse.com. 
one year ago. WebAssembly has been enabled by default in every major browser for over a year. So it's here, it exists. But it takes a long time to go from raw capability to something that we're using in our day-to-day -day work. Part of that is that WebAssembly, like machine code, isn't designed to be written by hand. You're not going to sit down and, in most cases, handwrite you know, x86 assembler. In the same way, you're not going to handwrite WebAssembly. What you'll do instead is still kind of create your application in HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then if you have other needs, you can reach for another language and compile that to WebAssembly. So the web stack can kind of be more versatile and more expansive now. In the early days, the past couple of years, we've seen a lot of, of effort and a lot of interest and a lot of experimentation coming from the C and C++ communities. Um, there have been experiments going back almost nine years now, I think it was all to compile kind of arbitrary C and C++ to the web in different ways. And that's yielded some really amazing demos in what I'd like to call the Will It Blend era of WebAssembly, where we have this powerful tool, and we're not quite sure what to do with it, but we figure, you know, we can just chuck some things in there and see what happens. And like, I don't know if that's useful or not, but we get things like putting AutoCAD directly in the browser, taking a you know, 25 year old, 35 year old code base, compiling it to the web, and now it runs inside a browser. Or you can put a browser in the browser. Or you can put a browser in the browser inside WebVR. <laughs> and this is really cool, and this is flashy, but, but the technologies that, use, that are useful aren't the ones that are flashiest. The technologies that are useful are the ones that have become so ingrained in our workflow as to be utterly mundane. And that's what I think the next year, the next two years, the next three years of WebAssembly will be. Is this transition from being an exciting demo to being kind of a, an everyday tool that you can use. Okay. Oh, no problem. Welcome. Okay. So we've kind of gone from this era of like, yeah, we can compile arbitrary things to the web. Great. But now how do we do something useful with it? And of course, in the Node community, we already have that option, right? Like, you can write a native Node module in C, C++, compile it, and reuse it. So what does this give us that's different? I think it's, it's helpful to look at, in Node or in other languages, where you do have that choice of high and low level languages and mixing them, when do people reach for the low level languages? What do they go for? Sometimes it's just preference. You know, it could be that you could do the same thing in a JavaScript module, but maybe a certain problem is just, it feels better, it feels more idiomatic to solve it in a different language. And that's perfectly fine, people do that all the time. Other times it's for performance. You especially see this in the Python world with scientific computing, you know, statistical analysis software, where you'll take a, a library, write it in C, so you have manual control over how like a large data matrix is stored in memory. And then you wrap that up in a module, and the callers to that module are none the wiser. They don't see that the implementation is anything but the language they're expecting. There's also the idea of portability, that if you write code in a low-level language, it's very easy to wrap it, because low-level languages don't make many assumptions about how and where they're running. You can wrap it in a way that you can share between other languages, so you can write a library that gets shared between Ruby and JavaScript and Python. An example of this is SAS. So anyone use SAS? Does everyone know SAS? SAS is a CSS preprocessor. You write some shorthand, it compiles your CSS into much more verbose CSS. It was originally written in Ruby, but because Ruby is also a high-level language like JavaScript, it was hard to mix that and combine that with code that might be written in something like Go or something written in Node.js. And so people came along and they re-implemented SAS in C++ and called it LibSAS. And LibSAS now has bindings to Go, to Java, to JavaScript, to Lua, and in the Node world we have Node SAS, which gets millions of downloads on MVM for the interesting thing about Node SAS is that it has this, this native code in the middle, libsas, but it's wrapped in a JavaScript module. So from the perspective of a Node developer, it feels like you're interacting with any other JavaScript library. It just <coughs> happens to be that the implementation is different. But the trick is it's not really just this library in, in C and then wrapped inside JavaScript. Because when you're dealing with native code, you also have to deal with the hardware that native code is going to run on. And so you have to compile that libsas.c into different versions for Windows, for Mac, for Linux, and not just that, for the specific CPU architectures in each of those. So 3264-bit, ARM, or Intel, and it'll put this combinatoric explosion where node sas, when you npm install it, 
goes up to GitHub and tries to download a natively compiled version of itself. Or it falls back and tries to compile it on your computer. And they have a matrix where they say, all right, we support Windows, Mac, and Linux on these CPU architectures. And every time there's a release of Node SAS, they post hundreds of megabytes of binaries to GitHub. So what conceptually feels like a native module wrapped inside a JavaScript module, one thing, simple, easy, is actually this massive combinatoric explosion of different compiled artifacts. <coughs> this is a problem we have in Node today. But what's missing? For one, ARM is missing. So if you have a Raspberry Pi or you're trying to do this on your phone, and you go npm install node SAS, all of a sudden it'll start looking for, you know, do you have Clang or GCC installed? Do you have all these other headers? It's like, why is my phone getting so hot? Oh, because it's having compiled libsass right there. Also, what about the web? Because you can't take arbitrary machine code and put it on the web. That would be horrifically insecure in most cases. And not portable, more importantly. <coughs> the, the ethos of the web and the ethos of web technology is that you can write something once, and it doesn't matter what form factor, or what browser, or what computing device that accesses the web, is accessing the web, it'll still be able to receive and run and execute and read that content. That's what WebAssembly solves. The idea that because it's kind of this abstract machine code that can then, by your target device, be converted very quickly and efficiently into machine code, into real machine code safely, um, it gives us that ability to actually say, take that one library, compile it to WebAssembly, and then brow your browser or V8 or some other runtime can take that, can be accessed by all these different runtimes, and that will convert it just to that one single artifact. Again, from the perspective of a Node developer, if you're using something like this, you npm install it, it feels and looks like a JavaScript module, you don't have to care what's inside, it just happens to be implemented in another language. So where is this being used for real? And this also, because those runtimes are in the browser and in you know, V8 and things like that, it means you could share that same module between those domains. So one thing we do <laughs> at Mozilla is the Firefox dev tools are actually implemented as a web app. It's React, it's HTML, it's JavaScript, it's CSS. Um, and so one of the things we had to do was build a pretty printer for minified JavaScript. If you're going into the debugger, you want to be able to like step through things and read things, and it helps if it's not one massive line. We spent years building very, very carefully hand-tuned JavaScript to make that fast. Again, we're just using WebTech for our dev tools, so like JavaScript was what we had. Now that we have WebAssembly, we rewrote the source map parser into Rust, not even trying to make it especially optimized, but because Rust is a low-level language and because we have the ability to kind of dictate how memory is used, when it's released, how things run, we got a 6x speed up in the naive implementation. A little more iteration, we actually got to be 11 times faster than the JavaScript version. It still looks and feels it's the same API, same, you know, it's a JavaScript module, but it has to be implemented in Rust, compiled to WebAssembly, and it runs a lot faster. You also see this with WordPress. So WordPress is working on a new serialization format for their posts. So in the database, they'll have a format called Gutenberg. And they need a parser for Gutenberg, but they need that parser to run a lot of places because WordPress has clients that are written in native code, they have the web, you know, the, the in-browser content editor, they have node services on the back end that need to process the stuff, PHP that needs to process it. And so they originally, while prototyping, wrote the parser in JavaScript. They recently rewrote it I think it's like 300 lines of Rust. And they got a median speed up of 90x. So one of their demos was to take Moby Dick and just store it in the Gutenberg format and just see how long it took to parse. The JavaScript version took two and a half seconds. The Rust version compiled to WebAssembly could parse that same post in 25 milliseconds. Previously, we didn't have the option on the web to, oh wow, that zoom did not work on that screen. My bad. I'm way down here. Um, so Moby Dick went from two and a half seconds to 25 milliseconds because low-level languages just happen to be better at, if you're writing a parser, they happen to be able to do that more efficiently 
than a high-level garbage collected language. Right tool for the job. We're seeing similar things happening in the front-end framework communities. So at EmberConf this year, part of the, the keynote discussed how all these modern frameworks, React, Vue, and Ember, effectively create a virtual machine. They re-implement a virtual machine inside the browser to kind of man manage the virtual DOM and state and kind of operate on that. And what's really good at building virtual machines? Low-level languages. And so they've gone, again, from hand-tuned, careful JavaScript to rewriting that <coughs> in a language, in this case Rust, compiled to WebAssembly. And what's interesting is Yehuda in this, in this presentation said, quote, the code itself looks very high-level, but unlike JavaScript, the high-level nature of the code doesn't come at the cost of unpredictable performance. That's one of the benefits of, of being able to kind of go down to this lower-level language that lets you opt out of garbage, that lets you control when things are allocated and free, is that you know how your code is going to perform. One of the challenges with JavaScript is that being garbage collected, as your program runs, it'll periodically stop well, the runtime looks at all the memory you've allocated and determines, you know, is this still live or should I clean it up? And so if you're trying to do something in quasi-real time, like you'll get stuttering as the GC kicks in. One of the other challenges with JavaScript or with the high-level languages is that there's so many different implementations of those high-level constructs. The GC in Edge is a different GC than the one in Firefox is different from the one in Chrome. And so what may be performant in one browser, in one runtime, may not be as performant in another. Whereas WebAssembly, again, being lower level, you have much more <coughs> control and many more guarantees about just kind of the, the baseline consistency of your performance. So all these stories, people were going to WebAssembly because they had a problem that was amenable to being solved at a lower level. And they happened to do it with Rust. And I think that's because Rust is is a language that gives you the control of a low-level language, but with the, the feel and the semantics and the user experience of a much higher-level language. And so often I meet people who have come into the JavaScript world or come into kind of these high-level programming environments, myself included. I started with Python, who are afraid of C and C++ because you feel like, you know, that's, that's where bugs like Heartbleed come from. Like, that's scary. If you mess that up, you can break the world. You can break computing. So how do we fix that? Well, Rust actually gives you the same sort of safety and control. It makes, makes it possible for you to kind of safely explore those lower levels. And I'll show you a little bit about what that means. One of the things I'm trying to do, and what I'm going to show you in, in kind of a live demo, is the notion that we have modules in JavaScript, right? And it's a question of if you've got node modules or ES6 modules, those are coalescing. Um, but the idea is that you can create some functionality, wrap it inside a module, and it imports some things and it exports some things. And JavaScript provides that interface. WebAssembly can also provide that interface. And so you can build up these trees of dependencies where you don't have to actually care about what's backing those implementations. So in the same way that like math.square root is probably implemented in C++, but you don't have to care as a JavaScript developer. You just have access to what you can call as a JavaScript function. We can do the same sort of thing in the future where where you want to be able to seamlessly interoperate and say, like, here's a problem, here's a function, here's a single module that would be amenable to implementing in another language. Laurie, I'll keep my application code high level in JavaScript because it's expressive and I like it and it's what the, the native lingua franca of the web is, but for these optimization problems, maybe I'll go implement that in Rust. Compile it to WebAssembly and now I can use it seamlessly with the rest of my, my dependency stack. The example I'm going to look at to hopefully kind of take some of the fear out of the low level is from Advent of Code, which is this wonderful series of, of programming puzzles that get posted every December. And, and I encourage you, I mean, we're very close to December, go and try it. The first puzzle from last year said, given a string of digits, sum all the digits which are followed by the same digit. And then imagine the last digit kind of wraps around to the first. So for example, 1122, well, one follows one, two follows two, one plus two is three. Whereas nine one two nine, because that is considered to wrap around, is just nine. All the ones follow each other, sum is four. Whereas one, two, three, four, nothing follows each other, sum is zero, right? Like so that's the problem. Implement that function. And I would encourage you to implement this in JavaScript and just kind of see what you come up with. 
we're going to do it in Rust. And one of the nice things about Rust is that it has high-level semantics. So we can actually approach this using things like iterators and, and kind of in a functional programming sort of way, where what we're going to do conceptually is say, we're going to create an iterator that goes through every character in the string, make a copy of it. We're going to make that other iterator infinite, so it'll just keep going in circles, and we'll advance it by one. And so now, if we move these iterators forward in lockstep, we say, yeah, what is current and what is next? If they're the same, we can add those to the sum. So in this case, one and one are the same, so the sum becomes one. Move them both forward. One and two are different, so we don't do anything. Two and two, sum is three. I like thinking about that. I like, I like the way kind of iterators and that sort of data manipulation solve this sort of, of challenge. Of course, at the end, you know, next loops around current ends, and we're done. So how does this look like in Rust? In Rust, we define a, a function solve, takes an input that's a string, and returns a 32-bit integer. We'll set up our two iterators. So current is input.chars, next is input.chars. Both of these give you that iterator that we get character by character by character. We'll call cycle on the next iterator, which says make that infinite, and skip one, which advances it by one place. So now we have this state set up. All that's left is to move these together in lockstep and compare the numbers, sum them up. Again, this doesn't look like C or C++. Like This feels like a much higher level language. That's what I love about Rust. This is all part of the standard library. So I can say, all right, current zip next, which gives me a single iterator that moves both of those forward and gives me you know, a value from each of them every time. I'm going to filter map over those, those values to say, all right, the current number and the next number, if x equals y, uh, that's a double equals that somehow is being rendered as a single equals, whatever. <laughs> but if x equals y, we'll call it x to digit 10. This is just like parsend, right? We're taking a string, turning it into a number. Otherwise, none. So like, they don't match, let's not do anything, let's just filter that out. At the end, sum all the things that matched. That's the entire Rust solution. Try this in JavaScript, it's really interesting. Like it, it's, you can solve it in just as many lines, but I feel like this sort of iterative, iterator-based approaches, for me at least, it matches my brain a lot better. Um, sorry, so we've got that. How do we, how do we bring that into WebAssembly? We're gonna use a tool called WASMPack. What WASMPack does is it lets you take a library written in Rust, and it'll compile it to WebAssembly, and then it'll provide some boilerplate JavaScript, it'll generate some JavaScript to kind of communicate between the WebAssembly web world and the JavaScript world, and it'll wrap it all up in an MVM package. The interesting thing about WebAssembly is it's just like a CPU. Like, it doesn't know what a string is, it doesn't know what a character is. Whereas JavaScript has really strong ideas, like JavaScript knows what a character is, JavaScript knows what a string is. And if you want to do a diff, something different, like, eh, good luck. So if we want to pass that, character, that string in between those two realms, we have to have some sort of translation layer. And so WASMPack will actually generate all that for you to say, like, taken, given a JavaScript string, how can I expose it to Rust as a you know, sequence of integers that Rust can then turn into a Rust string? And so there's kind of this, this notion that you have to move data between these realms. If it's just a number, you can move it directly. But if you're dealing with other data types, you have to have some sort of wrapper. Thankfully, those can be generated automatically. And once we have that all packaged up, we can toss it up on NPM, and you can download and use this module, again, just like any other module, not knowing what's inside. And so your experience as a node developer doesn't change, except the foundation you're standing on top of all of a sudden has access to more native libraries without the need to locally compile anything, and things become, in theory, faster and more reliable, because you can choose languages that in Rust's case, Rust is strongly statically typed, so like TypeScript, there are certain classes of errors that you can catch ahead of time, things like that. The web is becoming more than just JavaScript, but JavaScript is an excellent high-level language, so you'll still be using the same tools, it's just, if you start looking at your, you know, the tree of NPM dependencies, you may find some surprising things inside there. Let's do this live. So, over here I've got my Rust library, where, you know, the lines we just talked, get the two iterators, zip them, filter them, sum them. 
And I can also write tests in Rust, so I'm going to test that, you know, 1122 is 3, 1111 is 4. Just run test. Um, cargo is the Rust build tool. So it's going to build that, ran the test, it worked. Okay, so we know the solution works. What does it take to turn into WebAssembly? Two things. First, I have to pull in uh, cargo.toml is like package JSON for Rust. I add a dependency on WASM and bind gen. This is a library that can take a data type and kind of automatically generate a JavaScript shim that lets you move that data kind of in between those two realms. And then over here, I have to add, I have to bring WASM and bind gen, I have to require it inside my Rust library, and I have to annotate all the functions that I actually want to be exposed as WebAssembly. So it's really three lines changed. And now I can take this Rust library and over in the terminal, actually, terminal. No, terminal's over here. Over in the terminal, I can say, wasm pack build. I can add target Node.js. Um, by default, wasm pack will build an ES6 module. If you want to build a Node module, so like the whole require and things like that, target Node.js. All the changes, the, the .wasm file, the compiled artifact is the same, it's just the wrapping. So I run wasm pack build, and now what I get are these files. I get a JavaScript wrapper, I get a wasm file, which is my compiled Rust code, and it generated a package JSON and a readme for me, and it even generated TypeScript bindings. So if I go back over here and I actually look at those, uh, TypeScript bindings, so our function solve takes a string and returns a number. And if you look at the uh, admin.js in here, do, 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 you see things like a function to pass a string to WebAssembly, where it goes and uses a UTF-8 text encoder and turns a string into just like a series of bytes, puts those in shared memory, and the WebAssembly can read out of there. All of this was automatically generated for me. Got a package JSON. So what can I do now that I have a package JSON? Well, over here in another node project, what I can do is I can say, all right, well, let's depend on that that module I just compiled. Whoa, you know, install. Hmm. Sorry, my mic was just blown. <laughs> <laughs> so there's your package JSON. So I'm seeing this library advent because advent of code uh, is currently on the file system in this package folder that we showed. I could push this to NPM if I wanted to, but just because I'm on stage and I don't want to use the internet referencing the file system. So I NPM install it, it added the package. So if I look at my node modules, there's admin, look inside there. There's some JavaScript in there, but there's also the WASM file. And in fact, like the WASM file, just uh, for kicks, Like, this is what WASM looks like. It's a binary. It's a huge mess. That's not how XXD works. Um, so if you, like, do a binary dump of this, you can see, like, the magic number is null, uh, null ASM. So that's how it, like, identifies this binary file as a WASM file. You'll we'll never have to know this. But the thing is, we're going to feed all this gibberish to the browser, or to Node, or to any other sort of web runtime and good things happen instead of bad things, which is usually what happens when you get a gibberish. So now that I have that node module, I can have a Nudex JSON or JS that just goes and requires that library. And now I have this function solve that I can pass a string and get a number out of. So you know, there you go, the same thing. So if I run node, I can say const event wire. And there we go. Just looks like any other JavaScript library. So like 111 is 4. And this is utterly boring and mundane, but that's how it should be, because that's how we're going from WebAssembly being this flashy thing where people are like taking emulators and putting them in the browser, putting AutoCAD in the browser, to something that, well, hey, wait a second, I'm doing a bunch of statistical analysis or I'm trying to comp compute something and you know my, my code keeps changing. Well, maybe I can re-implement it chuck that single function into WebAssembly, use that in my project, and all of a sudden your toolbox has gotten that much larger. 
Or, if you're a library author, you know, you do this, and all of a sudden, everyone using your library automatically gets those benefits without any of their code ever having to change. This is just a normal, normal MPM module, right? So that's kind of the idea. We want to kind of go from something that's, that's marvelous to something that's mundane. Um, WebAssembly, you can find it at WebAssembly.org. Um, NodeSass, yeah, this is getting almost 3 million downloads a week and it's still generating just hundreds of megabytes of binaries. Um, one of the challenges, like you can't just naively pull NodeSass over because one of the challenges is LibSass presumes things like being able to read and write files. You're running inside the browser, and the browser, like just like with JavaScript or Node, just like Node, doesn't necessarily have access to those things. Node does. You have read file, read file sync. The browser doesn't. And so, if you want to take code that's kind of written for presuming a native environment, you have to add more shims, and it becomes more complex. But if you're kind of trying to replace a single module, it's perfectly fine right now. Um, a great many languages will compile to WebAssembly. There are efforts to get. I obviously C and C++ are already there. Rust is there. Um, there are efforts to get languages like Go and Swift on WebAssembly, C Sharp on WebAssembly. Uh, I like Rust a lot. I think Rust expands what I can do more so than most other languages I've learned. Um, that's really great. But WebAssembly as a whole is a great tool. Um, Nearform, our gracious host, actually has a, have ported this module CFEs to WebAssembly, which has 125 different uh, kind of mathematical functions implemented in C. But you can pile up web something and all of a sudden you have access to all those math functions inside the browser or inside Node or inside whatever runtime. Um, speaking of whatever runtime, this is where things get weird. Because just like Node.js kind of took a browser engine and said, well, actually, we don't need the HTML and CSS. We can just take the JS part. Well, other people are saying, what if we just take the WebAssembly part? What if we build something that takes WebAssembly as a binary format and compiles that down to native code or takes it as a binary format and just runs it in a modified runtime? So Cloudflare has a project called Workers, which is kind of an edge compute product. And they're saying, well, instead of spinning these all up in virtual machines, if the user code is supplied in a language that compiles to WebAssembly, if they just supply WebAssembly, well, maybe we could just have a single, effectively like a single Node instance, right? and just run a whole bunch of WebAssembly modules. And they're all isolated from each other in the same way that when you're browsing the web, one tab is isolated from the other. Um, and that's interesting. We're also seeing similar things at, at Fastly, where they have a, an experiment called Terrarium, which, based on our server-side WebAssembly sandbox, lets you kind of upload C or Rust or TypeScript and run it natively on their edge nodes. And again, they can do that safely because WebAssembly, just like JavaScript on its own, doesn't have access to raw sockets or the file system or things like that. Like those have to be provided by, <coughs> by the outside environment. In the same way that Node gives you, again, things like FS, the FS module to like read and write files, the browser doesn't. You can kind of provide the execution environment to WebAssembly. So if you don't want to be able to open a raw socket, you just don't give it a hook into that sort of function. Um, and that's kind of the, the interesting thing. So we've got we've gotten to what we call the minimum viable product, the MVP of WebAssembly where you can write code, you can compile it, you can run it anywhere that the web runs. What's happening now is we're looking at, well, all right, how do we make that useful? How do we make that easy? And then what is missing that we need to add to WebAssembly to make it go to more, more places? Uh, my colleague, Lynn Clark, wrote an incredible article called WebAssembly's Post-MVP Future, a cartoon skill tree, where she kind of likened these, these things we want to add to WebAssembly in the future to kind of like a, a video game RPG progression where you're like, all right, I've got the basic stats, and now what do I want to invest time into, and what does that unlock later on? So she kind of drew this big thing where it's like, all right, we've got the MVP, we've got most of the skills we need, here we go, to have small modules interoperating between JavaScript and WebAssembly. We have things we want to do, like letting high-level languages come in easily, so like being able to access the garbage collected that's already in your browser. Um, better support for in-browser debugging and things like that. But all these things are being worked on. Uh, the Fastly and the Cloudflare things are examples of taking, building a separate runtime for WebAssembly and putting it like in CDNs, on the edge, whatever else. WebAssembly, despite the web in the name, is really just a universal binary format that happens to have been built by web browsers. And so it's going, going to go to a lot of other places. But just like with 
I mean, kind of just like with Node, like you took something that was built for one thing, and now we realize that hey, wait a second, you can take a JavaScript engine, put it in more places, and all of a sudden, really cool things can start happening. That same sort of progression is happening in in the WebAssembly world right now. Um, if you want to get started, again, I highly recommend Rust as a as a good language to start with. Um, I like what Julia Evans talked about Rust. She said in a keynote at RustConf in 2016. Rust is empowering because it gives you access to those low-level, you know, low-level control, low-level capabilities, but it feels high-level and it has a lot of safety built in. And so it lets you look at something and say, well, wait, maybe I can write that program. In the case of Julia's project, I think she was working on a uh, on some sort of device driver, and she's now gone on to use Rust to build a, a Ruby profiling debugger. Um, just like, hey, wait a second, if I have, if I have a low-level tool that I feel like I can approach, that actually really expands what I can do as a developer. Um, Carol Nichols has also written an amazing book called The Rust Programming Language. It's free online at rustlang.org. Um, good place to start. Otherwise, that's WebAssembly. WebAssembly takes, takes the web stack and it gives it the low-level complement to JavaScript's high-level expressivity. Uh, if you want to learn more, rust-lang.org, great place to start. The Rust community is friendly, it's welcoming, it's open, it's helpful, and we have spent an enormous amount of time trying to make sure that the tooling around Rust is some of the best, both in general for a developer, but especially for someone trying to target WebAssembly. Uh, Wasmpack is on GitHub. It's also a good place to start if you want to start trying to take like a single function and re-implementing and seeing how that works. Um, as I mentioned, I'm on Twitter as Callahad. Uh, I'm around for another 45 minutes before I have to run and catch the last train out of Dublin. Um, otherwise, thank you so much, and I hope this was at least interesting, if not useful. Do you want to do, if anyone has any questions, okay. or any more questions? I feel like I was running over time, so I feel like... I'm happy to do questions if people are already sitting in here. One question from my side. Certainly. So I'm assuming the bottom layer runs fast, right? It runs um, typically, I mean, like native, it's effectively right? native. Yeah. But is there any kind of overhead uh, of calling bottom from JavaScript? There used to be a lot of overhead calling a bottom function from JavaScript or vice versa. Okay. Um, we fixed that. It's effectively equivalent. There should be no discernible difference between calling a function written from JavaScript, calling a function written in Blossom versus one written in JavaScript, and vice versa. Um, Chrome should be, if they haven't fixed it already or haven't improved it, that should be coming very soon. Um, the, the initial MVP was just like, make it work, now we're making it fast. Um, I was wondering how you might, uh, would it be able to, I, I noticed that you were able to port a function and just call it by advent.solve. Would you be able to port, say, something like a more of a class-based structure? Um, so, you, if you wanted to, to port something that was more like class-based or or had more of a more structure to the data structure, yeah. you could do that. But you kind of have to you have to do a lot more than manual work to determine like what does that look like? How is that exposed to the JavaScript side? Um, I don't know if Wasm Bind Gen can. It should be able to handle that right now. Um, yeah. Basically, yeah, you can do that. But the only data types that natively move between are numbers. So if you want to have something like a struct or an object or something else, you have to manually like put that into memory and then have the JavaScript side read it out and turn it into a class. There. I'm, I'm more, more interested in like stateful uh, classes. Like for example, yeah. if you have a player on the screen uh, and what is the height of the player? Player dot get height. Player dot set height. Right. Um, you know, so that, that's, but I mean, so, e even, even if it's just pure functions, it's still f so and off and, I can, uh, I can f and about, awesome. Yeah, the, the state part is that the way that JavaScript and WebAssembly interact is that they both have a common view onto a linear array of memory. And that it shared array buffer, we had to disable it for a little while because of Spectre. Um, it's back. The idea is that you can put data into this this memory that shows up as a type array on the JavaScript side and just shows up as memory on the WebAssembly side. And you can read and write from that kind of whenever you want. Um, and so if you wanted to say, like, maintain some state in the WebAssembly side,
but use it regularly and update it from WebSUSE. So use it from the JavaScript side, you can do that. You'll just be reading from that array every time you want to access that, that value. And that's fine, because that, that memory is scalable. Uh, so if you were to maybe write a getter and a setter uh, and expose that as public, that yeah. should do it? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, well, I guess uh, JavaScript got a bad name, I guess, because of part of the fragmentation of the engines that the different browsers implemented for it. Is there a concerted effort or consortium to stop that happening with, with WebAssembly that whatever instruction set one browser supports, the other one will support, there's not going to be some nuclear arms race of instruction sets? No, we've, we've, it's been really wonderful. We've had participation and active involvement from every major browser vendor, along with other people developing engines like Cloudflare and Fastly on both the pre in pre 1.0 spec and ongoing. Um, WebAssembly is a binary format. It is fixed and versioned. So we built it in such a way that we could expand it and you would have to do feature tests just like in JavaScript, but that's possible in a way that wouldn't like unexpectedly break the world. If we ever had to change WebAssembly fundamentally, again, the binary file is versioned so we could say like, all right, this is a version two WebAssembly file. And then the engines could report whether or not they support that. The hope is to never need that, but we have those kind of escape patches built in, along with an existing track record of really great cross-browser, cross-vendor collaboration. Uh, this should be as universal as, as humanly possible in this industry. Sorry, a quick question. Is there any benefit of writing this in web assembly AST instead of compiling from Rust? Like, is Rust be as optimized as someone who specializes in writing in the AST? It, it should be possible to get the same degree of, in the same way that, like, think of it like C and native assembly language. Like, in theory, a good compiler should be able to match yeah. more or less most developers. Um, we are effectively there for Rust, to the best of my knowledge. There's some things where, like, we can make the binary a little smaller. So that example I showed is like a nine kilobyte mm -hmm. WASM file. You can get that down a lot smaller with certain tools, but um, but the actual Machine code that's a, that's executed is very efficient. Um, it should similar efficiency. Yeah. yeah. One of the great things about the the JavaScript ecosystem and the NPM ecosystem is that we have access to everything, and people don't write perfect NPM modules. So when we have a problem and we need to debug, we can go right down into the third party module that we're pulling in, and it looks exactly the same. <coughs> was everything else we're using. If we go down the WASM route, are we in danger of getting this kind of poly-language environment where when we get into those kind of difficulties, we're going into God knows what language that we have to learn in order to try and debug the problem? I mean, potentially, there, there are challenges with when you're debugging. I would argue that Node that's already here, if you're trying to debug something in Node SAS, all of a sudden you're inside C++. Um, in, I think also in other JavaScript ecosystems, if you're dealing with minified JavaScript, it's pretty obfuscated as well and, and difficult to kind of grok. The WebAssembly binary format, just like an ES6 module, it statically defines all of its data types, its imports, its exports. So you can kind of, without having to execute anything or really understand anything, you can see exactly what, what it's exposing and what it's taking in from its environment. We're also working on source mapping, uh, better support for debuggers. Um, it's all in the works, but yeah, it's it's challenging. But I don't think it's more challenging than the world we're in right now um, at the lowest levels. Which again, I, the idea is not WebAssembly for everything. The idea is WebAssembly for like small specialized tasks. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I get that. My worry <laughs> is that people go beyond that and start to write lots of things that don't need to be optimized in right. in in other languages. Well, I mean, and it's it's something where. Again, I think I'd argue for that Rust thing. I was I wrote the iterator. I solved that puzzle in Rust because I think it was more ergonomic to me than any JavaScript develop or any JavaScript solution I'm able to make without reaching for things like Lodash. Um, and so I'd rather debug that than something written in vanilla JS with a third-party you know, functional programming library. So I think it's kind of it's a brave new world. But if you're if you're in the web ecosystem, you're already dealing with. You know, you've learned JavaScript, you've learned SQL, you've learned HTML, you've learned CSS. What's a couple more? <laughs> <laughs> You're smart, you can do it. Um, all right, I think, is pizza here? Yeah, yeah pizza's, pizza's here. here.
I'll be hanging out for a little while. Feel free to ask me other questions. Thank you so much, Callahan on Twitter. I'm around. Thanks. Thanks.